All right, we've already covered the introduction to the requirements of how much we need to deposit to reach our specific retirement goals. So now we're going to work through a couple problems. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that I want $150,000 a year in retirement. Okay? Each year. I am 25 years old today. I am going to retire at 65. I am going to drop dead at 95. But as long as I hit 95, I had a good life. All right. So the first thing that we have to solve here is figure out how much money do we have to save. Most of the time, like we talked about before, people, what they do is they say, hey, I'm going to deposit X amount of dollars. That's going to give me some pot of money. And then at that point, I'll be able to figure out how much I need to pull out. That's actually the backwards way to figure this. What I want to do is figure out how much money I need to retire in today's dollars. If I was going to be retired right now, what do I want my retirement to look like? What is my spending going to be? I'm then going to take that number. I'm going to adjust it for inflation, bring it forward. And we're saying that I've got $150,000 to maintain my purchasing power, like we went over on the introduction. So. To figure out how much money I need to save, what I want to do is back up all of these cash flows to see what they're worth. And 150,000, 150, 150, 150, 150, what's that look like? It's obviously an annuity. So if that's an annuity and we're backing things up, then to get this number, what I want to use is the present value of an annuity. So what we're going to do is take 150,000 times the present value of an annuity. K is going to, is going to equal how much we're going to make in these investments. So how much money is being actually generated within this fund while I'm in retirement? If this fund is producing a very high rate of return and there's a lot of money being generated internally, then I don't have to have a big start number here. If this fund generates very little money internally, if that happens, I have to start with a much, much bigger number. So as interest rates go down, this number is going to go up. And so we're going to solve it using three assumptions. K equals 10, N equals 30. 30 is how long we're going to be collecting this 150,000. 65 to 95 is 30 years, so my N equals 30 for that distance. I also want to calculate this to see if I got a slightly lower rate of return. 150,000 times present value of an annuity, K equals 8, N equals 30. And what if I only got a 4% rate of return? So it's 150,000 times present value of an annuity, K equals 4, N equals 30. So what this kind of represents, the long range average of the stock market is 10%. So if we're in all stocks, we're going to earn a return of about 10%. If we're in a diversified portfolio of about 60% stocks, 30% bonds, 10% cash, we're going to probably end up with a rate of return around 8%. And if we put this into all certificates of deposit and short-term bonds, then we're going to be playing it very safe, but we're going to have a very low rate of return. So what I want you to do, hit pause real quick, and I want you to calculate these out, then hit unpause, and we'll have the answers for you. Okay, so hopefully you hit pause and you're not cheating your way through, so you have all the answers now. But I'm going to look up these factors, and these factors are going to be 
0.269 and 11.2578 and 17.2920. So if we multiply this across and I'm earning a 10% rate of return, if K equals 10, then I have to save 1,414,035. If K equals 8, so we're multiplying this one down here, I have to save more money. I have to save about 1.6 million. 1, 6, 8, 8, 6, 7, 0. And if I have a rate of return that's only 4%, right, not that much, I actually have to save 2,593,800. So the process we went through is first we have to calculate how much money we want at retirement each and every year. We're going to figure that out in today's dollars. Then we're going to project it using inflation rate out into the future like we did in the intro. And for simplicity, I'm saying that that's 150,000. We look at how long we're going to be retired from 65 to 95, n equals 30. I then have to determine how aggressive am I going to be investing in retirement. So if I'm all stocks, k equals 10. If I'm all, uh, if I'm 60% stocks plus bonds plus cash, little lower rate of return, 8%. If I'm down here at a 4% rate of return, all CDs. I've made my uh, portfolio so safe, I've been getting such poor rates of return that I have to get basically more than a million dollars more with that option. And so actually having your retirement funds all put into CDs is a very dangerous way to go. You have to actually have a huge start number rate. So we now have these numbers. A couple things I want to explain. Certainly we don't want to use 4% because it's a horrible rate of return. We have to save too much money. And as long as we are on this side of the equation, we can be in all stocks because we've got plenty of time. When I'm within three, four, five years of retirement, I want to start shifting some of my money into bonds, some of my money into cash. On this side of the equation, we don't want all stocks. We need a diversified portfolio. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard the story about the man who drowned in a lake with an average depth of a half an inch. And so you're thinking, how in the world can somebody drown in a lake that's only average is a half inch deep? Did he hit his head, fall face down in the mud and drowned? Did he have heat stroke and fell and drowned? Did someone drug him? No, he drowned in a hole that was 15 feet deep and he couldn't swim, so he drowned. The average depth is a half an inch. The average rate of return of the stock market is 8%. But some years it returns negative 40%. Some years it returns 27%. This last year we've had a great year of plus 20%. Some years it's down 12, other years it's up 15. It goes up and down and up and down. You really don't know what's going to go on for three or four years. And so the average rate of return on stock is 10%. But that's too dangerous to do because what happens if we are invested in all stocks and that's when the next recession hits, six months after we retire, and stocks get hit 40%. We're stuck. We have to sell stocks at a low so that we can eat, pay rent, pay for our car, et cetera, et cetera, locking in those losses. However, if I'm in a diversified fund of stocks and bonds and cash, and we hit a recession, and so when we hit a recession, people stop buying cars, they stop buying houses, businesses stop investing. And so the cost of money goes down. There's less demand for money and money is supply demand. 
And the cost of money is interest rates. And so interest rates will go down. Well, if we're holding bonds, what happens to bonds when interest rates go down? Their value goes up. And so now we've hit this recession. I'm 30% in bonds. All my bond values are going up. I'm going to live off my bonds for three or four years. And then hopefully I've lived off those bonds for three or four years and some of my cash that when this recession finally ends, and almost all recessions end, some end in two years, some end in six years, some end in four and a half, but we'll sell our bonds, we'll get through, the economy recovers, we're back to a robust economy, stocks come up, and now I haven't sold my stocks at a low. And that is really critically important. In my opinion, way too dangerous to have your money all stuck in CDs. Mathematically, we'll get there in a minute. It just takes so much money, you can't get there. And it's way too risky at retirement, within a few years of retirement and in retirement, to be all stocks. You must have a diversified portfolio so that if interest rates skyrocket and your bonds values fall, stocks probably went up and you're going to sell stocks. If we hit that recession and your stocks fall, bond values go up, we can sell our bonds then at a high. Okay, now we need to do the second half of this equation. We calculated this side over here because we need cash flows every single year of 150K, which is an annuity. We've taken the 150,000 times present value of an annuity, K equals 8, N equals 30, and we're going to use 8 because we want a diversified portfolio. We multiply that, and now I know that this pot of money that I need to get to is 1.688 million. It sounds like a pretty big number, but when we calculate how much money we need to deposit each year, it actually isn't that much money. So the way that we calculate this is a little different. We got to travel all the way back to fourth grade math. I know that's quite a distance for some of us. Uh, some of us never actually crossed fourth grade math to begin with, so Maybe it's a bit of a challenge. But normally what we've done here and done in the uh, earlier part of the year is we took how many dollars we're depositing every single year and we multiply that times the future value of an annuity. And for this, we're going to say that we're earning 10%. K equals 10. N equals the distance from 25 to 65. So 25 to 65 is 40. So for this distance, n equals 40. So a equal 40. We multiply how much we're depositing every year times future value of an annuity factor equals how much we need to save in the big dollars. However, for this question, we don't have this number, but we do have this number over here. This number over here is 1,688670. So how are we going to solve this equation? Well, we have to go all the way back, like I said, to fourth grade, and we do the old isolate x type of calculation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by the same thing. I'm going to divide by the future value of an annuity, k equals 10, n equals 40, and on this side, future value of an annuity, k equals 10, n equals 40. These two cancel each other out, so we erase here, and what we get is x, or the dollar amount that we need to save each year, we're going to take the money we need and divide it by the future value of an annuity k equals 10 and equals 40. So we look up that factor on the chart, and that factor is 442.59. I divide 442.59 into 1,688,670, and what I end up with is 3,000. 
$3,815. That's how much we need to deposit every single year, $3,815. So all of a sudden, the $1.688 million doesn't seem like that huge of a number because right there we're looking at, you know, 340 bucks or something a month. Uh, not all that much. One of the big reasons that it's so small is because we're saving here for 40 years. And so now comes the question, how much does it cost us to wait? If we're going to save for 40 years, all we need to save is $3,815. Not all that much. That's at 40 years. But how much do we have to save if instead of starting at 20, we wait until you hit 35? Or we wait until you hit 45? Or wait until you hit 55? Obviously, we're going to have to save more and more and more. So let's go ahead and do this calculation. So what happens over here in my formula It all stays the same except N changes. So N goes from 40 to 30. And then we're going to look up that one. And our factor is 164.49. I divide that in and I get a total amount that I need to save of 10,266. So, I've almost tripled the amount of money I need at 30 years up to 10,266 for 30 years. And it gets worse, much, much worse. So if I start at 45, then my N is only going to be 20. So I look up my factor, and my factor for 20 years is 57.275. I divide that in, and lo and behold, I need to save each year $29,483. We have pretty much waited to the point here at 45, it's almost undoable. I got to save about $2,500 per month to pull this thing off. If I'm waiting till I start at 55, I have 10 years to generate $1.6 million. So we know this is going to be an astronomical number. So we got the same equation, k equals 10, n equals 10. We take our factor, and our factor is 15.937. I divide that in, and I have to save $105,959. That's a big number. That's, if we're looking at that, we're probably in trouble. And a number of people find themselves in this position. A number of people with very high incomes. I used to do a decent amount of uh, personal financial planning, and I had people coming into my office every day. And they said, hey, we're making a ton of money. We need to be serious about retirement. We're 10, 12 years away from retirement. We've already saved a couple hundred thousand dollars how much more do we need to save and what should we do? And so I start running these numbers and even though they make $300,000 a year, uh, maybe the wife is a CPA at a, a big firm and making a quarter million dollars and the husband is a skilled mechanic or an engineer or something making $100,000, $150,000. They're making $350,000. They have two leased BMWs. 
a $1.6 million house with a $1.2 million loan, and they're saying, hey, we can save $2,000 a month. We can save almost $25,000 a year to knock this thing out to make sure our retirement's fine. And I look at them and say, you're off by a factor of four. You're not going to be able to retire. It's just not going to happen. And at that point, people tend to get really mad at me. But the math doesn't lie. It just doesn't. When you start early, like say you're 25, and you get your first big job at 25 or 30 or something like that, and you're going to make $50,000 or $60,000 a year, you know, 5 6%, 8% at 3800 bucks looks very, very doable, extremely doable. The most important dollar you'll ever save in your life is your first dollar. You actually got to get started at saving. And when you start early, you end up with a tailwind behind you that just makes everything work very smoothly and very easily. Okay, now I'm going to show you some adjustments that we can make to this very, very straightforward and simple process. In the intro, we had talked about that if you wanted $65,000 worth of purchasing power today, that we move this forward at the future value of a dollar, K equals 3, the inflation rate, N equals our distance, 25 to 65, which is 40. And this came out to 212.030. And so we needed to save 212.030 each and every year. Now, when we calculated it all the way back through, we came up with a number of a little bit over $5,700. All right. Well, let's say that 5700 is extremely doable for you. And you're thinking, what would happen if I added a trip to Hawaii every single year? How much is a trip to Hawaii? And you look it up, and it's like $4,000. So all we need to do is add $4,000 here. Now we need $69,000 in today's money. We move that forward, future value of a dollar, K equals 3, N equals 40. We get a slightly bigger number here. We get a bigger number here. Now we figure out how much more do we have to deposit every single year, and is it worth it? So it might be worth it to you, or maybe your budget's really tight, because when we're balancing out what type of life we're going to have in retirement, we certainly can't take every single dollar out of today and have a horrible miserly life and not go on vacation and not have fun, right? We got to balance this thing out. So that's an adjustment you can make. One of the other adjustments that you can make that works really, really easy is you say, you know what, what would it be like to retire at 60? Well, all you have to do is take the 65, move it to 60, my numbers change here, 25 to 60. Instead of an N of 40, I have an N of 35. And instead of an N of 30, I have an N of 35 on this side, and you rerun the numbers. What usually happens is people get really close to retirement, and they're saying, we want to retire at 65. And it's like, oops, we don't have enough money to retire at 60 or 65 or whatever their target number was. Well, how would things change if instead of retiring at 65, I retired at 68? How big of an impact will that have on how much money I have to deposit and how much money I have in retirement as I do this kind of back and forth type of thing? Because what then we do over here is we go from an N of 40 to an N of 43. And interestingly enough, 
when we extend our N on this side, especially when we're saving over 30 years, the three extra years of you depositing money into that account really doesn't matter all that much. What really matters is you've already saved a huge chunk of money for 40 years, and that huge chunk of money gets to gain interest for an extra three years before you take anything out. And so that becomes powerful. On this side, we were going to be retired for 30 years. Now we're only have to support ourselves for 27 years. And so we're adding over here. We're subtracting on this side. One of the other kind of down and dirty um, simple adjustments that we can make, and this is a little bit of a shortcoming of this, uh, um, of the way of doing this, is if I've calculated I need 212.030 each year and every year in retirement, if I pull the exact same amount a year from now and then two years and then three years, inflation is going to eat up our purchasing power. We're going to be in trouble, potentially. A couple things to that um, that kind of make it not matter. One is that typically you spend a lot of money in retirement your first seven, eight, ten years in retirement. So from 65 to 75, you do a lot of traveling, you got to eat a lot, you're active, you're doing things hopefully. Most people at 75 to 85 start to slow down. They're not going on week-long trips, they're going on weekend trips. They're no longer traveling to Europe or out of the country or even all the way across country. They're going 100, 150 miles down the road and staying in Palm Springs or San Diego or something like that for the weekend because physically they just can't do it. And so the demand you have for money actually out 20 years starts to shrink. The one caveat to that, if you're in assisted living, assisted living could cost $7,000 a month. So other than assisted living, your, uh, your amount there is going to shrink. The other adjustment we could do is we said we're earning 8% on this side. If we think inflation is running 3%, all we really have to do is subtract 3% and use a K equals 5. Because then we're kind of not counting 3% of our return every single year, and that will give us our adjustment for inflation. The other adjustment that we have, if we don't want to do that, we want to leave it at eight. Is that over here, if we're saving $5,700 every single year or the other one, we save $38.15. Typically, as you get raises and promotions and things are going well, you save a little bit more, save a little bit more, save a little bit more. So if you're saving 10% of your income into a diversified stock portfolio and you get 3% raises every single year, then this side, these numbers are all going up 3%. This side is all going up 3% and it's pretty much going to be a wash. You're going to get a very simple to understand kind of down and dirty number. The other thing that I want you to really be cognizant of is when you go to a fee-only planner or when you go to someone who wants to sell you stocks or mutual funds or other retirement, they're going to have their computer system. And their computer system is going to make adjustments for inflation. They're going to make adjustments for inflation on this side. They're going to make adjustments for how much money you're going to think you're going to get in increasing raises. They're going to make adjustments out here in healthcare for healthcare projections. There's going to be lots and lots of things going on. But actually, they should come back pretty darn close to a number you have. If they came back at 5,900 or 5,500, I would be pretty comfortable. If they come back and say, you need to deposit $9,000 every single year, then we're off 
by a lot. If you're at an insurance broker or something like that, you gotta be very careful, like in whole life insurance and some of the other products, not only from insurance companies, but from uh, uh, some investment advisors are really heavy on how much they charge for fees. This difference could be all sucked up in management fees, cancellation fees, policy fees, all that type of stuff. And what I want you to do is say, wow, you say I need to save 9,000. With this kind of formula here, I get 5,700. Show me on my formula how I have to make adjustments to get near your number. First off, this person works for you. You're paying their fees. Whether it's a fee-only planner or a mutual fund, you're paying their management fees. It is not your job to figure out their sophisticated program and their computer modeling and understand how it spit out $9,000. Any investment advisor would be able to come up to you and say, oh, well, I see what you're doing here but you haven't adjusted for inflation, so cut this down to five, and we're gonna increase this number up here. Let me show you kind of how we're gonna do that using the time value of money charts, and we're gonna maybe make only 2% adjustments because you're in an industry like printing or something like that in which wage growth is really small. And so they make a couple of these adjustments, and maybe they look at this and say, oh, well, we adjusted here, we thought this is how much you want after tax. And so we actually come up with a much bigger number because we adjust for taxes. Whatever the excuse is, they should be able to take this system that you understand and adjust it back to the number, not the other way around. You don't have to do that because you're paying them. They're not paying you. All right. So hopefully that gives us some understanding of how this would work and will give you the ability to take control of your own situation and calculate how much money you should be saving for retirement so that you can reach the goals that you need to reach. All right, thank you.